Greetings sailors and welcome to Patreon Supporter Spotlight number 55. I've decided to do a bumper warships edition this time. We've got three battleship replays for you and they're all going to be premium battleships as well. And uh, I think they all represent different aspects of battleship play quite nicely. I mean they don't cover the entire spectrum because uh, there are some reasonably unique battleships in terms of playstyle in this game but um, yeah it, it broadly speaking covers the uh, the main play styles of battleships I think we could say. So first off we have Darnith in the Evergreen War Spite which uh, despite not having the monster HE shells of the regular British battleships is still a very very capable tier 6 premium battleship. I mean, having said that, the Queen Elizabeth doesn't have those monster shells either. It gets the extra penetration, but not really the extra fire chance. And, uh, of course, the same goes for the Monarch too, the other 15-inch gunned uh, regular Royal Navy battleship, because, of course, there's also the Hood, uh, which gets the AP, but not the HE of the regular line, so it's kind of worst off in a lot of ways. So, as you can see, it's a, uh, what is this, tier 7 game? And even in tier 8 games you can do okay in War Spite, but the main thing that you are lacking at that point is uh, range. I mean, your armor's not going to hold up that well in uh, bottom tier games regardless, but uh, it's, it's definitely the range that you start to struggle with. The guns, however, still perform very, very nicely. So, Darth just managed to land a rather nice... Citadel hit there, and this Dunkirk might even give him another one, although it's going to be a very low damage Citadel, because this Dunkirk doesn't have a lot of hit points left at this point. They've just blundered out into the open, which is not something you can really afford to do in a Dunkirk. So I'm going to say right off the bat, this is, well, it's not really right off the bat anymore, is it? We're kind of like, what, two minutes into this? Okay, I'm going to say somewhat right off the bat, but not quite right off the bat. Uh, this is going to be not maybe a very exciting battleship game. And so this is where we're starting with our little journey through the uh, the life cycle of the battleship. Is life cycle even the right word? Not really. I should probably have thought of a better word there, but now that I've thought that I need a better word, I can't actually think of a better word, so well done, brain. But, um, yeah, this is going to be a very solid battleship game. It's going to be a very good result, but I think you'll probably agree with me by the time we get to the end of this one that there wasn't really anything flashy or exciting. And I think this in particular... Uh, I mean, you know, the War Spite has got, as I've said, very good guns, and in terms of accuracy for a battleship it's definitely one of the better ones but uh, you know sometimes the guns will troll you quite a lot and sometimes even when they're not trolling you you know you're, you're getting the good shots you're doing the damage but it's not really very exciting and so I think this is one of the things in particular that can put people off playing battleships is is matches like this and matches like this are sometimes compounded by the fact that your guns can be incredibly trollish at times. But uh, that's not going to be so much the case for Darnith here. Maybe we'll see that a bit more in the following two replays, which are both German premium battleships. So, yeah, he's just kind of, like, you know, trading fire. And so is most of the team, and it's not really a particularly high-octane situation. And I think... That's maybe, you know, a thing that puts people off World of Warships generally, some people anyway, is that it can be like this sometimes. It can just be a rather slow, patient exercise in dismantling an enemy team. And if you're here for the action, well, that's not really um, going to be what you wanted. I think of all the classes, if you want the one that kind of gives you the most consistent pace in terms of action I would say destroyers but even then only certain destroyers you know the, the Japanese destroyers generally speaking don't fit that mold very well but you know if you go for the for the gunboat lines for the uh, for the Russians or the Americans or to some extent the new Pan-Asian destroyers as well you can maybe more get into the thick of it and uh, you know get a bit more adrenaline going that way but this this is definitely not 
adrenaline inducing in any way, shape or form. This is just him picking out targets of opportunity, trying to go for the low health targets, watching his angling, um, more or less staying with his teammates, you know, nobody is doing anything particularly heroic because we saw what happened to that Dunkirk when they just ploughed into the middle and uh, just, you know, keeping tabs on what is where. Now, when I'm watching a replay, I, I don't know what the, uh, the the state of people's minimaps are, but I always try and at least um, keep tabs on everything that's going on around me. And, and I particularly find it useful for the to have the minimap labels on to, to see where uh, particular enemy destroyers are. And in this case, there is only one left at this point, a T-22. So that's not that big of a threat, especially when the uh, the surviving destroyers on his own team are currently engaging that uh, that's now probably quite dead T-22 because uh, yeah, you can't be afford to spotted in uh, to be spotted in that thing for terribly long. So if they can uh, take out this Colorado, that's going to be quite nice. Um, he's just in the position of not being able to stealth up, not fast enough to get away, and also being a fairly high value target. The Colorado is a nice ship when you can be on the push, when you can be on the offensive, but if it goes against you, if you get into a situation where you have to fall back, yeah, that's not good in a Colorado. Because generally speaking, you... you uh, unless you've got a friendly destroyer to lay smoke between you and the enemy team and you're able to um, get undetected if you've been firing your guns, then uh, yeah, it's it's going to be a bad time. They do have one more Colorado who's still fairly high health at this point, but I mean, you know, we can say this enemy team's lost, basically. They've just not been um, keeping pace in terms of doing damage, in terms of getting the kills with Darnith's team. And uh, at this point, it is fairly decisively against them, and it would be quite hard for Darnith's teams to throw this away. They've, they've got a fairly effective blob of firepower here. The enemy team kind of blobbed up a little bit as well, but they were just not trading fire effectively. So that's his spotter up, uh, which he doesn't need in terms of the range, but uh, for getting over this island, yeah, that's going to be a little bit more useful. So he's reasonably broadside this uh, Colorado, there's probably not a huge chance of citadels against a Colorado with these guns at this range, but still that was a pretty solid hit, nearly 10,000, and uh, I mean I think he's maybe more interested in the, the cruisers just because you can, you can get those citadels, you can get those really big hits, but even against other battleships these guns do perform very very well. Hell, I've even had decent games in tier 8 with these uh, with these guns. So, nothing else to shoot out other than the Colorado just now. And see if we can get some more hits. Well, that wasn't quite so good, but never mind. It was a bit more of an awkward angle, perhaps. Because uh, that enemy Colorado has realised that sitting just broadside is maybe not the best plan in the universe. So I've just lost there. Leander. There is, I mean, there is still another enemy battleship. There's still that Bayern that was um, on the other flank and uh, has actually shot Darnith once or twice. But... They're kind of completely out of it, basically. You know, by the time they catch up, um, it's it's not really going to matter that much. The, the enemy team, I mean, they're not like. Oh, there we go. He took out the Pensacola. Very nice shot there. Uh, the enemy team are not. You, you know, they're like they, they've basically slipped past the position where they could pull this back. Um, but they're they're not completely hopeless. I mean, I've seen certainly worse results than this. But uh, it still doesn't look too good, is it? <laughs> Does it? Because it's uh, it's it's quite a lot of uh, um, uh, lead at this point for for Darnith's team, and because it's an epicenter game, um, oh, <laughs> that was a very nice hit. Uh, because it's an epicenter game, it's not like they are super far ahead in terms of points. The enemy team's actually had more success in trying to cap, uh, but. You know, they've just managed to kill so many more enemy ships that they do still have a reasonably healthy lead. So that Colorado is looking um, mighty tasty in terms of being a target. It's much too close to just about 10 kilometers, and that's a, another not terrible chunk of health, although 5k and it reckons that was three penetrating hits Nah, <laughs> some of those were zero damage pens you might have noticed the smoke there by the way uh, we have a bit of a uh, a mix in terms of the uh, the patches these are from so this one 
is, let's see, this is a 6.8 games. This is before the smoke changes, so he could sit in smoke and be unspotted. And we've also got 6.12 for the Scharnhorst game that's coming up, and then a 6.5 game, which is actually the game that's following this one. That's going to be a Tirpitz game. So, yeah, if you see things like that where people are in battleships and being in smoke and unspotted, that's why. So there goes the T-22, who lasted, you know, longer than you might have thought, given that they were um, not trying to be that sneaky or stealthy. The Bayern is now just completely alone and isolated, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's not the fastest ship, but they, they chose poorly in terms of uh, their positioning, uh, definitely. Uh, meanwhile, I mean, you know, he's... Uh, Darneth just came over and linked up with his tier 7 battleships, and I think they lost one battleship themselves, but um, that blob of, of battleship firepower, that can be very, very effective. And there we go, the T-22 from beyond the grave, just getting a little bit of extra damage, but at this point it doesn't really matter. It's two ships left, and uh, although the Emerald has managed to get a, a sneaky smoke and might actually... Uh, you know, land some torpedo hits there, that's actually quite a good ambush drop there, and they've killed the Gilizer now. It's a bit too little too late, really, it's not going to turn this around. In fact, the Gilizer now's own torpedoes took that emerald. Torpedoes direct front. So, uh, at this point, you know, if I were in Darnith's shoes, I would just front. head straight towards the Bayern, and instead, I'm not quite sure why, but he's being a little bit more cautious. He's trying to position himself so he can fire over the limb of this island, but the Bayern's actually now starting to turn in, so he's going to end this with, you know, he's already got over 100,000 damage, he's going to end this with a reasonably good damage count, but uh, he could have certainly gotten more damage here, and uh, yeah, the Bayern's guns can overmatch the armour on this thing, but so can Darnith's guns, and when there's just, you know, one ship left, with a reasonable amount of health, and uh, it's, it's at this kind of, like, last minute scrabble to just get the last damage out of the last guy. At that point, you might as well go in and be aggressive and just do what you can. And instead, he's, he's you know, managed to <laughs> back himself out to get that nice 10k hit to get a high calibre. But uh, he could have had his guns in action sooner, essentially. So, you know, he did get there in the end, uh, although he's now awkwardly positioned broadside, but at this point it doesn't matter that much unless he gets completely obliterated by the Bayern, which would be annoying. But uh, it's not like it would actually lose them the game. So another 5.6k, 3 pens. And he's going forward again. Why are you going forward again, Darnith? I don't know. You're just taking yourself out of the possibility of getting some shots in. I can definitely say Darnith doesn't have a secondary build on this thing. You can get the, with a maximum range secondary build, you can get it to 7.2 kilometers. I'm not sure that uh, manual secondaries is ever really worth it below tier seven though. You could put it on the war spike, but it's just such a jump from, what is it? Minus 15% dispersion to minus 60% dispersion at tier seven, yeah. So, 138,000 damage, nearly 139,000 damage. It was a really good result, 1,949 base XP. So, you know, he wasn't top tier, but was able to get pretty far ahead of his teammates in terms of the, the actual XP that he got. So he must have been doing uh, a fair bit of damage uh, over what they were doing. But of course, being mid-tier did help a bit because, you know, if you're finishing off and shooting higher tier targets, that does increase the amount of XP you're going to get out of it. But still, despite the fact it was almost 140k, it wasn't really a, a particularly exciting game, was it? It was a good, solid, boring, fairly standard battleship game. And as, as I said, I think that just puts off some people from battleships in Tyler. You can have a really good game, and yet it can also be that. So next up, we have the 6.5 game. This is Lo Squalo in the Tirpitz. Top tier, lots of battleships in this one, lots of German battleships in this one. And this is going to be more on the silly side, and this is... Uh, perhaps particularly relevant to the German battleships because 
uh, they can sometimes get away with doing things that other battleships can't. And that doesn't exclusively go for German battleships. I mean, the Amagi at tier 8 also has very, very good armour, for example. But the Tirpitz and German battleships generally just have that combination of uh, being quite hard to citadel, they have good AA, they have good secondaries, and of course, some of them have torpedoes. So it's just that all-round combination that kind of makes up for the fact that the guns can be pretty damn troll. I know this puts some people off German battleships incredibly, but I mean, they have some things going for them. For, for battleship shells, they are reasonably fast, and they have decent penetration. It's just in the area of dispersion that they fall down. So for some people, that can be annoying enough that they just don't like the German battleships full stop. But personally, I think I'm I'm one of those people that it's like I know what I'm getting into at this point when I when I play German battleships I'm I'm used to it I guess I I know what to expect and I think the other qualities of the battleships make up for that not particularly reliable main battery performance to the extent that the Tirpitz is still my most played ship. So there's not a lot of destroyers in this one. In fact, the enemy team's lost their destroyer already, and so. Uh, if we want the cap circles, well, you know, the destroyer can only do so much. It can only be in so many places at one time. So La Squalo is himself going to attempt to cap C. And this is going to be a heck of a lot easier than trying to cap B when you can't do so stealthily because there is actually some island cover here. But even so, he is, um, you know, able to be shot by, uh, what is that, uh, Nuremberg? Something down there anyway. So, yeah, there's one of those uh, cruisers that's basically trying to reset him a bit. And I've actually fast-forwarded this because it's not very interesting. He's air-spotted for most of this. They do know he's here, but he's able to use that island to, to get cover, crucially, and uh, get the cap alongside the Amagi that's here. Now, the team has split rather awkwardly between the west and the east, whereas the enemy team is looking a lot more cohesive on the minimap right now. And that isn't necessarily a good thing. In fact, that really is very rarely a good thing because it means the enemy team can bring more firepower to bear at uh, any one particular flank. And so, although they have two cap circles, which is a nice position to be in, um, because they don't have two cap circles that can be kind of defended from each other, um, it's a bit more awkward than it at first seems. So. Uh, it's kind of in the enemy team's court at the moment, um, and it looks like, you know, if I were in their position, um, the more attractive place to push would probably be over at the A cap. Now, there are two Tirpitzes there still, which represent a fairly significant uh, chunk of firepower and armor, but there's only also the Akatsuki there, and I think the carrier's concentrating more on that side as well, because there are carriers in this game. But, uh, yeah, it's not looking that good. Now this is the point where we can point and laugh at that enemy turbits for running into an island. Haha, <laughs> that's so silly. Fancy running into an island. That's uh, that's not something La Squalo here would do. Um, oh wait, oh. Um, okay, yeah. So this is the part where it starts to get a bit silly. La Squalo made a bit of an awkward turn, hoping that he could, uh, you know, pull it off. But he's in a battleship, so the answer is. No, there are very few battleships that would have been able to uh, squeeze round here. And so now he is in a secondary duels with this Bismarck at pretty close range. His angling relative to the Bismarck, however, is obviously much better. So um, although he didn't manage to get some huge chunks out of that guy, he still isn't doing too badly health-wise. And he's actually, for having run aground, you know, he's not in a completely terrible position. He could be in a much worse one. There's not that many enemy ships that can shoot at him right now. They're all much more concentrating on the Amagi that's pushing forward. So this is just awkward, if, if nothing else. It means he's got to spend time scraping himself off the rocks to get himself back in the fight. But he's not completely out of it. He's still got some things he can shoot at. It's just... That was, you know, the kind of thing you could get away with in a Tirpitz or a Bismarck that you might not necessarily get away with in a North Carolina, for example. Although the North Carolina might actually have been able to make that turn better. I'm trying to think, you know, something like the Colorado certainly could have, but uh, maybe maybe not the North. I, I don't know. I can't remember offhand what the, the turning radius is. 
So once again, somebody in secondary range, and you might be wondering, by the way, if he, you know if he's got a, a, a float plane fighter, why he's not using it. I, I wondered if it was some kind of replay glitch, but then later on he does actually use it. So yeah, he just for some reason forgot he had a float plane fighter. I don't know what his uh, captain spec is. He might have gone into full secondaries. Um, you can, I mean, you can. Go into an AA spec as well. Um, tier for tier, the most effective AA on the German battleships is probably the Geneiser now, in fact. But, um, you know, Tirpitz and Bismarck also do benefit greatly from manual AA and AFT and BFT. So you can do it that way. Or you can go into the secondaries. As well, I think that's one of the nice things about the German battleships is you, you get that choice. And the secondaries option will be more useful more often, certainly. But if you get into a game where there is a carrier, um, that AA can really save your bacon. But in this case, you know, the AA, the base AA is still going to be decent. Um, but it will help if he can remember to put up his uh, catapult fighter, because that will disrupt enemy drops. Not that it mattered in that particular case, because some of them got shot down anyway, and then he tried to drop on the wrong side, basically. If he, dropped some of his torpedoes on the land effectively, which is not really what you want to do. Um, so, you know, it's maybe not going to matter that much if this enemy carrier player is not the best in the world, but yeah, still, it's just good practice. So the Amagi is still alive somehow, the Amagi that pushed around the corner. Um, there's a couple of battleships, enemy battleships, that, that sort of came over this way. But yeah, they've concentrated over A, basically. You know, they went for the flank with the fewer number of enemy ships that they could take out. And... Um, that's the sensible thing to do, you know, you you mop up the the weaker side and uh, And then you are able to turn around and have a numerical advantage. You're always seeking that numerical advantage in world of warships Blobs of battleships is not necessarily uh, or just blobs of ships generally is not necessarily a bad thing In fact, it can be quite a, a valid tactic and you sometimes see people complaining about lemming trains But you know depending on how it's done depending on on what happens exactly a lemming train is not necessarily a bad thing at all Because it means you've got a large amount of firepower available It's when people just sit there and do nothing with that advantage in firepower that it becomes a problem so he's gotten the attention of the Kutuzov, which is bad, although he did slightly slide out of his smoke. Uh, it's a little bit of a pity that uh, El Squala wasn't able to hit him for more damage. But uh, yeah, at the moment it's not looking so good generally. The enemy team is capping A. The one lone turpits over there isn't going to last that much longer, probably. They've not managed to, to cap B at all, but um, yeah, I mean, El Squalo is not doing so well right now. Three fires, and hey look, there's more planes coming in. Launch your float plane, flighter. Flighter, yes, that's the thing. Launch your float plane, Lasqualo. Lasqualo, put your float plane up, Lasqualo. No, okay, never mind, it's fine. <laughs> He's only got three fires going and, you know, is burning all the health. Fortunately, however, this enemy carrier is really not very good. Um, they break off the attack, having lost most of one squad. And then... Circle them back round again. Yeah, the sensible thing to do would have been to take them round south and um, just, you know, maybe go for one of the more isolated ships. And instead he's bringing them into the AA bubble of two German battleships at close range. And uh, it's not really working out. So even though it's a Saipan with tier 9 planes, yeah, that's not how you do it. So fortunately for Losqualo, this enemy Saipan player is not particularly good. This is absolutely not what you do in a, a, a carrier. And even then, you know, if, if he'd been a little bit unlucky, he might still have eaten a torpedo. He might still have been in a situation where that torpedo caused a flooding, at which point he would have been dead. So, yeah. Munchy damn flow plane fighter. And this was a while ago. You know, this was what? When was 6.5? This was, this was well into last year, so... Um, I'm, I'm sure he, you know, pays more attention to these things now, or at least I would hope he would. It's always interesting going back to older games, especially your own older games, and, and thinking, huh, why did I do that at the time? I don't know, I wouldn't do that these days. It's interesting seeing um, how you've progressed as a player sometimes. Anyway, so, uh, that is the troublesome uh, Kutuzov dead, and there's also an Algeri that's been taken down. So it's four versus four. And because they held the cap point advantage of so long, 
they've actually got a very comfortable cushion. Now, at one point, the enemy team was worryingly ahead on kills, but that's not so much the case now, obviously. So it, it comes down to a bit of RNG, uh, it comes down to who's playing better, and it also comes down to maybe the fact that their enemy carrier is not very good, so they're not contributing very much. So between Osqualo and this uh, Allied Bismarck, well, you know, that Tebbets is very healthy, but maybe they can take this guy down. Maybe, between them. But um, it's not like, you know, they are the only ships left as well. There's also a Miyoko and, what is that, a Cleveland? Something, I can't quite tell from the, uh, from the minimap label in the preview window. So, that's another heal back and a nice hit for uh, a bow on shot. And um, that was probably superstructure pens, maybe. I, I don't know. Anyway, um, but the bad news is they've just lost that Bismarck because the Saipan, it was a completely horrible drop. But they did get at least one hit and they got the flooding. And that was what killed that Bismarck because clearly their damage control was on cooldown. So this is a bit of a risky turn, he doesn't want to get too close to the Tirpit. Um Personally, I'd have just brazened it out because um, taking that turn and exposing his broadside, I mean the, the enemy Tirpits took a much bigger chunk of damage, but Lasqualo cannot afford to lose the health right now. So although he does beat out that uh, Tirpitz and actually gets the secondary kill, launch the float plane Lasqualo, launch the float plane! Uh, it's, you know... It's not exactly the most optimal situation, but he's getting away with it because Turpits. And if anything, that is the theme of this second replay, is those, those battleship games where you are maybe not playing optimally, but, you know, you get away with it because battleships. And sometimes that battleship just ability to absorb the hits and bounce the odd shots and whatever uh, will carry you through. So the Miyoko is playing with their speed a bit. This is not looking good. 1,500 hit points. That's one or two good salvos from these cruisers. And <laughs> he's getting very lucky in that they're not aiming that well. But still, 383 hit points. Come on, come on. Where's the heal? There's the heal. Come on. Okay. Oh, he's got the heal going. Um, but still, that was remarkably close to being dead. And it didn't need to be that close. It certainly didn't need to be that close. But uh, here we are. Oh, it's a Nuremberg. It's not a Cleveland. Anyway, tier 6 cruiser. I knew it was some kind of tier 6 cruiser. So the Miyoko is throwing a bit more broadside. And I think Squalo has been able to range in a little more on the speed now. But still, he's not quite nailing it. But uh, he's almost getting there. He's also finally put some flow plane fighters up for the first time in the game. Uh, I mean, this, like I said, this sideband player is not good, but even a single top hit at this point would be his doom, potentially, so... <laughs> yeah, finally he remembered he had a float plane fighter. So Nuremberg is possibly coming into view. Tries a bit of a shot there, might work out, and for a kind of guesstimate shot, that wasn't too bad at all. So, another close quarters, that's his second of the game. <laughs> This is completely ridiculous, but hey, Turpits. And if you can just nail this Miyoko, all that's left is the Saipan, who seems to be just about deplaned of torpedo bombers at this point. So the Miyoko is the last hope of the enemy team, but not anymore. And it wasn't just him, of course. There is still Astros and uh, an Amagi left alive. So even if Lasqualo had not lived, um, there's a pretty good chance that this would have been a win regardless. But it's just the, the qualities of the Turpits that meant that despite the fact that, you know, there were some derps in this one, he got away with it. He absolutely got away with it. And now he's sitting pretty at uh, nearly a, uh, 160,000 damage. And he might actually be able to get a bit more out of this Saipan, but it depends how lucky the Amagi gets with their shots. Or, well, how lucky. How well they're aiming plus how lucky they are, because there's always those two things in combination. So the Saipan is um, belatedly trying to escape north, but I mean, yeah, even though there are over 900 points now, if they'd been further north to begin with, they probably could have just 
rode out the timer and uh, waited for the thousand points to accumulate but as it is no they're going to manage to finish this one with killing all ships so even though that's not a lot of damage it's actually the straws that gets it <laughs> oh never mind well okay then so no final kill there but still 157,000 damage uh, he got a fireproof and a dreadnought confederate and two close quarters and these are probably you know more likely to be the kind of battleship games you will regularly see on YouTube, as opposed to the War Spike game I showed you. 2400 base XP, not bad. Because, you know, it's a lot more entertaining, even if technically the first game was the better played game. And it was, you know, the more solid and uh, the more sensible game. This was not sensible, this was absolutely getting away with doing silly things because Turpits. So a nice healthy profit there. For some reason he's got some consumables resupplying for doubloons, or did at the point of this, but as I said, this was many, many months ago, so doubtless uh, he doesn't anymore. There's, there's really no reason to, to to resupply for doubloons, unless you're seriously hard up for, for, for credits, but even then, um, it's you know costing you actual money, and for a tier eight premium, you might as well just use the the, the credits so, lastly, we have K538 in the Scharnhorst, the tier 7 premium. And this is going to be our third and final bit of, uh, you know, battleship play. I'll note at the start here, interestingly, he's using the premium damage, uh, not the damage control, he's using the premium heal, the repair party, but he's using standard damage control and I think the standard uh catapult fighter if i if anything i would never take a battleship out without the premium damage control but uh you know that's one way to do it i suppose and it will save you a, a bit of credits but i mean yeah i don't know you've got to be pretty hard up for credits if you're you're having to on your premium battleships not take the premium consumables so i've already said gneiser now basically has the best aa tier for tier pretty much I mean, the tier 9 and 10s are no slouch either, but just at its tier, the amount of DPS the Gneiser now can put out at the long range and the amount that you can boost it by is uh, absolutely no joke. Scharnhorst, by contrast, has, I think, the better secondaries but the worst AA. Or, or not worst, but worse. And so, although you can still put an AA spec German captain in it and do reasonably well, it's definitely less special, it's less trollish. Now this is a double carrier game this time, uh, it's a top tier game as well, so at least it's not higher tier carriers or anything, but even so, uh, two lots of, of carrier planes might be a bit tricky to deal with, because even the best AA can be completely overwhelmed just by sheer volume of numbers. So again we've got a bit of a split, but that happens more often on this particular map. Um, K538 is also in a division this time with... Uh, something i can't read i can't actually read the name or remember the names sometimes i remember to do that and other times i don't you know what we're gonna very professionally look this up if this is not the smoothest video by the way this has taken many many days to to attempt to record this over multiple attempts so yeah this is my best so far um so you're just gonna have to go with that um oh wait no the score screens don't even give the full Thing. I don't know, we might, ca we might catch sight of those names at some point, though, but anyway. So, like the Tirpitz, like the Gneiser now, the Bismarck, um, the Scharnhorst is a pretty tough ship. But unlike them, well, it has a rather different calibre of main guns. It's got the fast-firing 11-inch guns, which is the actual... Uh, historical configuration of both of these ships. Now this caused some controversy when they first came out, when they were first released, and I'm sure there are still some people that are maybe a bit peeved about the fact that if you want the actual historical gun setup, you have to pay actual money. Whereas, of course, the Gneiser now only comes with a 15-inch gun option. Both ships were planned to be upgraded, but Gneiser now just got thoroughly wrecked by a repeated RAF bombings, and Scharnhorst itself, um, you know, survived to uh, fight a bit more in the war, but eventually got taken out by uh, 
numerous British ships, including, of course, the Duke of York, with the campaign that we've just had. So, so far, he's done a bit of damage. I mean, these guns are still pretty decent. They're still good enough. Um, there are times when you'll need to reach for the HE shells against angled ships. But if you get broadsides, even broadside higher tier battleships, um, they're still decent. They are still quite good. But it's almost, you know, if, if you're facing a Scharnhorst, it's almost more the rate of fire that you worry about rather than the actual shells unless you're angling completely horribly because there's no chance of them overmatching and it, although the rest of the ship is is quite you know it's still got torpedoes it's still got decent secretaries you don't want to get into a close range fight with this thing it's just overall maybe a bit less of a, a threat even though it is still a very very capable ship so they're pushing around on this flank a little bit, but his uh, division mate in Onta, I think it's Onta, um, yeah, he pushed aggressively through the middle and basically made himself a target for quite a large segment of the enemy team, who are largely concentrated on the other side. There are a couple of ships on this side, including this uh, Cesare, who is going to be slightly annoying, and also the October Revolution is going to be slightly annoying as well. On the enemy team, it, it's actually almost the lower tier ships who are going to be the more effective. So the uh, the independence, the enemy independence got spotted but was far enough away to uh, effectively cloak up again. The Karga on the other hand, the floating hotel, or no wait that's the Yamato isn't it? The floating tower block I guess you'd call it. Um, yeah that's not going to get out of this situation alive. They, they chose poorly in terms of, of uh, positioning themselves and uh, yeah they're much too close to stealth up again so that's quite useful. That is actually quite useful because the Karga does represent quite a big threat. Doesn't have particularly tough planes, but it gets lots of them. So, I mean, K538's team more or less evenly spread out, whereas the enemy team blobbed up. So we're seeing a similar thing as happened to the last game is that in the, the flank where the enemy team had the much bigger superiority of numbers. They are basically beating his own team on that side and um, starting to push more aggressively on that side but they haven't done so particularly quickly and so that has allowed k538 and rear hatch here and also the texas behind them to just push around and start chipping away at their rear so now they've got this issue of well they don't have uh, a particularly big blob of fire uh, firepower available but the enemy team is is now in uh, stuck where you know they they have to focus fire on two flanks because they're now getting a little bit encircled and this is all the while the k538's team has a cap circle advantage at least for the time being because of course they are capping a so this is a you know they're down on ships and it's not the best situation but it's actually not that bad it could be worse so there's some planes incoming and um, it looks like these are going to be American dive bombers and it's around about now by the way when I was watching the replay I absolutely hadn't noticed before this point that oh yeah no hang on this is from that patch where there was the weird replay bug with the shells not appearing so you can see the damage numbers coming up you can see the muzzle flashes but hey look you can't actually see the shells or the tracers so it's going to be for a slightly peculiar experience but I mean as we know from the current patch and that really annoying message that pops up and blocks the middle of the screen uh, Wargaming does occasionally from time to time introduce these fun exciting new replay bugs and generally they fix it within a patch or two but still it can be annoying if you're in a position of you know looking at a lot of replays. So rather than press the advantage north and uh, try and take out the Atlanta and the October Revolution, they've actually now turned their attention to K538 and, uh, well, just this Texas, because he's lost his Shaw's division mate at this stage. So this is, this is suddenly turned around. He's gone from being on the offensive to suddenly, oh, I have to run away now. And that means he's actually going to have less firepower available. So he's going to take out the Atlanta first, which is within range of him at the moment. And, um, you know, if he can take out the Atlanta, it might mean, you know, the enemy 
uh, well, that the allied carriers can be a bit more effective because that thing, of course, is uh, not very nice to deal with. The Chisare, meanwhile, I mean, he took a bit of damage off him, but he's been able to keep his distance enough. He's, he's had enough speed, and because it's the Sharnhorst 11-inch guns, he's not been able to seriously threaten that guy. And so he's in a bit of a... a, a a sticky situation, but at least he's in a better off situation than that Texas who just cannot be fast enough to make a getaway. So there goes the cap circle advantage. Uh, the Buscovita snuck through the middle and took the uh, D cap and is now going to go after the carriers. So possibly RIP carriers. And uh, although there is still one enemy carrier left in play, it's the tier 6 carrier, so it's maybe not quite as big a threat as it could be. So, who knows? Our carriers might successfully defend themselves against the Briskovica, but maybe not. We'll see how that plays out. So he's gotten himself into a position where he can basically use this island to safely make a turn, get his, point, uh, his points gunted back at the enemy, or possibly his guns pointed back at the enemy. Yeah, this honestly is the best version of this that I've tried. <laughs> It's been one of those videos. Maybe I went a bit overboard trying to do three replays, but um, I just felt like it, I needed to make up slightly for the, the patchiness of videos recently. Although I kind of have with also, I've been streaming more. So, you know, twitch.tv slash pointyhairjedi. Go and find me there and watch me play Will of Warships and, uh, you know, hopefully not fail too badly at it. So he's turned to reacquire. And I think he's done so because, you know, the October Revolution moved away. They took out the Atlanta. And so this is now a bit more of a comfortable situation. He's also maybe thinking about, you know, oh, I could get the cap. But at best, at the moment, he's going to be able to stop the enemy team from uh, getting cap points while it's being contested. But he's not going to be able to cap it for his own team. So this Chisare, he's taking some health off the Chisare. Um, I think he's preferentially wanting to try and take out the Cleveland just so he removes that threat of fire. But, you know, the Chisare's guns are still a threat as well. And that's one of the nice things about the Chisare. It is, I think, arguably overpowered when it's top tier. But it stands up to being bottom tier a hell of a lot better than most other tier 5 battleships. You know, arguably the Congo maybe, but just because of the Congo's speed and range. The Congo's effective firepower when bottom tier is really not so good, just because it doesn't have that many guns available. The Chisare, however, it, just, it has a really nice combination. And I think this Chisare player, you know, is a reasonably good player. They know that because the Sharnhorst guns cannot overmatch, they can get away with showing rather more broadside than they could against, you know, uh, a Gneisen now, at which point it would be more about the RNG. So the Cleveland bumped an island a little bit and you can see he's uh, tucking himself in a little bit. He's maybe thinking, you know, he's forced the Cesare back. The Cesare does not want to get into a close range fight with him. And so perhaps he can finally cap if he takes out this Cleveland. We've lost one of the carriers, by the way, but um, one of them did also take out the Whiskey Pizza. So there is still a carrier in play that might prove to be decisive. So there goes the Cleveland, but there's the Chisare, who is just not going to let him cap. Now he takes a quick look around, we can <clears throat> we can see the health of the, the enemy Gneiser now. And it is just enemy battleships left at this point, it's the October Revolution, this Chisare and the Gneiser now. And I think it's about now that K538 is kind of thinking, well, this isn't going to work. If I just sit and let him chip away at range... Uh, it's it's not going to work out well for me. So he's now going to try and actively close the range with the Chisare, who uh, is starting to turn a bit more broadside than they really should. But still, no great big chunks of, of health that he, he's able to take off here. He, he's absolutely just having to chip away at this guy, as this guy is having to chip away at him, because Shambles. So the Chisare got away with pulling a turn that they would not have in uh, against most other tier 7 battleships. So this is a case of somebody knowing their enemy. And as it turns out, the October Revolution and the Gneiser now have gone north to maybe uh, deal with their own October Revolution or the carrier. I don't know if, they, the, if the carrier was spotted, if they just figured that, um, you know, it must be in that direction. But as it is, he's finally able to kill the October Revolution and... He's not got a lot of hit points left, and this is the part where having the premium damage control party would have been 
probably more useful. We would have been able to put the fire out a bit sooner. But uh, as it is, the fire burns out well before the point of uh, being able to kill him. So there's the enemy independence. They are still ahead on points. And uh, although, you know, it's not completely unwinnable for the enemy team, um, they'll have to work hard at it. I mean, the enemy guys now is now seriously low health. And uh, in fact, they're now dead to the Allied October Revolution. And that just pretty, uh, uh, pretty much leaves the, uh, the independents who can't have a lot of planes left by now and an October Revolution. And although, of course, K538 is himself low health, uh, they just now have enough numbers to make this doable. Although they might lose their own October Revolution in the process. So yeah, this is a pretty tall order for an October Revolution. So it looks like they're actually going to lose the Ranger, maybe? He's very, very low health. He must have been, you know, spotted for some amount of time to have lost that much health. Although, having said that, actually, no, not against battleship guns. You can take quite a lot of, uh, of uh, 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 carrier's health quite quickly in most circumstances if you get some good RNG coupled with some good aiming. So this is a longer range shot. You know, this ship does have a pretty good range, but... Um, at that range, you know, the, the fall off in, in penetration uh, coupled with the inability to overmatch means that um, Scharnhorst's guns, you know, they're, they're most effective at closer ranges and uh, against softer targets. If you're going to be firing at, at battleships, you really do want broadside targets and you want closer ranges. He, he almost would be maybe better off firing HE at this October Revolution at this range. And uh, that would, you know, have the chance of setting some fires, but it would just be more reliable damage, basically. Instead, he's trying to go for the carrier, who represents, um, a, you know, a decent amount of uh, victory points, should he be killable, because their own range is dead, along with their own October Revolution. And that's actually brought the enemy team just ahead on points. So, it, you know, it, it, it's not inconceivable that the enemy team could win this. It absolutely is not. But they are about to lose this independence, and the, the October Revolution would have to work pretty hard to take out uh, K538. And there is also now the Texas coming through to the middle as well. So he's got himself into a position where both remaining ships can fire at him, which is not optimal. The Texas, by the way, you know, also did a reasonably good job in this. You know, they were able to cap and... Uh, I don't know how to did with plane kills, but just sometimes surviving is uh, a bit of a, a useful thing in of itself. Uh, although I don't know if they've done that well in the, the in the score screen, but the fact that the Texas is alive at this point certainly makes this a much more comfortable scenario than it might otherwise have been. And I don't think the Texas was doing anything particularly wrong. I think they just got stuck in a slow ship on that flank and were forced to retreat because, you know, it, it's... Not like K538 wasn't also forced to retreat himself at one point. So this is just about winding up. Um, they're now ahead on points with the carrier kill. They've got two cap points worth of victory points ticking in towards them. They're about to get three. So it just remains to be seen whether or not you know they can kill this October Revolution before they get to a thousand points. But he's on now 5,000 health. So I would think that they can do it. And the fact that he's now more or less broadside to K538's guns, um, he should maybe get the kill. Maybe. Hopefully. Although this guy is starting to angle a bit and he's also slowed down perhaps. But that's giving more of a broadside to the Texas. So we'll see who gets the best angle. This guy's not in a good position. Um, he's absolutely, you know, he's between a rock and a hard place. Although it looks like the Texas is firing a chi which I don't think you really would do at that range. And you actually see Own Tur there <laughs> commenting on that in the chat. And the only, only way we can tell that he's firing HE uh, is because, of course, he set a fire. And we know for a fact that uh, K538 wasn't. But as it is, K538, with 33 seconds on the clock, gets that sixth and final kill. And that nets him a Confederate Dreadnought, uh, uh, the Bernie one, fireproof, there we go. Kraken, he got a first blood and a high caliber, 148,000 damage done, and top of the team. Not as much XP as Los Squalo had in the previous game, but, you know, for this third and final game, 
we had the genuinely close, tense, well-played battleship match where it wasn't him just getting away with doing derpy things. He was, he was throughout the entire game, um, playing very well, paying attention to his enemies, paying attention to his surroundings. Um, he, you know, he could have just fallen all the way back at that one point where he was, you know, all the enemy ships turned and were firing at him. And instead he gauged when the correct time was to re-engage, to press forwards again. And, you know, he, he, again, he could have tried to stick it out in the cap circle and realised that that was the wrong call. And so he pressed forward, shortened the range on the Shizare, took that guy out, and then was able to come up round behind and finish off those enemy ships. If they'd all ganged up on him, he wouldn't have survived. That's the that's the point where maybe the enemy team could have turned this round to be a win, is um, if, if all three of those surviving battleships had gone for him instead. But then the enemy carrier, well, no, their carrier, rather, would still have been in play. I mean, the enemy carrier would still have been in play as well, just with not any planes. So, um, yeah, it was not a great situation for them either way, but I think it was winnable for the enemy team, potentially. But um, K538 was just able to play really quite well there and secure the win so there we go three types of battleships game it's not of course the only types of battleships game uh, battleships game nope <laughs> battleship games there we go why was i trying to pluralize the wrong word there i don't know i listened to somebody saying attorneys general the other day that was probably it so <laughs> silly brain still the best attempt at recording this i've had i swear honestly um so anyway where was i yeah so you know, of course, you do see people doing things that are just bad, like, you know, sailing around in their Fuzos and only firing at 21 kilometers range. And later on, you see those same people doing exactly the same thing in Yamato's. Uh, we could have had a replay like that, but um, I, I like to think that my uh, Patreon supporters, for the most part, know better than that. So even though I do sometimes get sent games like that Middle Bismarck game where it's entertaining but derpy, and I have games like that myself where it's entertaining but derpy, um, it's this final game that represents the, the, the well-played battleship. That's the ideal that we all want to aspire to. That well-played but tough game where just through skill you come out on top and you bring it around to be a victory. Of course, sometimes even a well-played game doesn't end in victory, but... Um, yeah, I don't know, at, the, at that point you're in the argument of is it better to be lucky or to be good? Although, of course, the correct answer is, well, both. <laughs> so, that's enough rambling. I should stop now, finish the video, did I? So, hopefully you've enjoyed this, and if you have, you can leave any comments below, you can hit the like button, you can sub to my channel if you haven't already, and, as always, stay tuned for more.